Radio. Okay, so the next thing we're going to look at is um, dive equipment. All right, and um, all the bits and pieces of gear that you obviously familiar with already should know, and going to be teaching your students all about. All right. First up, regulators. All right. Um, we should be all be familiar with all the terminology. We have the first stage. All right. The first stage. Of the regulator, its job is to reduce the high pressure that's in the tank, so 200 bar, to an intermediate pressure. All right, so this is the bit that goes onto the scuba tank, obviously. Our second stage is our mouthpiece. Its job is to reduce that intermediate pressure to the surrounding pressure or ambient pressure. All right, um, have two of them: alternate air source. Alternate air source is usually marked with a bright color, also a longer hose, all right? and also known as our octopus, all right? color theory, or again, alternate air source. All right, inflator hose, all right? mechanism to attach to our buoyancy compensation device, all right? buoyancy control device, um, that basically allows us to bring the air into the BCD, and lastly, our submersible pressure gauge, which tells us how much air is left in the tank, quite often attached to these. Obviously, we have also depth gauges or alternatively a computer. All right, so that is our regulator. Simple and straightforward. Um, at this stage, obviously, we should all be familiar with them. All right, now. Open circuit valve regulators. Air from tank goes to the diver and then is expelled into the water. Open circuit meaning that we're breathing it in and it flows back out. All right. um, it uses less air than free flow continuous supply. All right. So for example, um, you have systems where they continuously deliver air. All right. So for example, we do helmet diving. All right. Um, for people um, on our pontoon stations, got a big helmet over their head, attached to a hose, air is continuously delivered into that helmet and just bubbles out. All right? This system obviously uses less air than that free flow um, system like with the helmet diving. All right. It avoids carbon monoxide buildup by reducing dead air spaces. All right? So a dead air space, the first air that I breathe in all right, is the last air that I breathe out. So a snorkel, for example, is a very, very good example of a dead air space. When I breathe out, that's the first air that I breathe in. Okay. Um, simple and inexpensive system versus a closed circuit regulator where air is recycled in the system like a rebreather. All right, so a closed system is you have no air bubbles, all right? you're breathing in, all right? and that air is recircled uh, or recycled, sorry, in that same system. Okay. Our first stage reduces the high pressure from the air tank to an intermediate pressure, approximately 10 to 13 bar above ambient pressure. So ambient pressure is one bar here at the surface, two bar at 10 meters, so on and so forth. All right, so approximately 10 to 13 bar above the ambient pressure. You have a balanced first stage. The tank pressure does not assist in opening of the valve. So you have balanced and unbalanced, all right? Um, most regulators these days are balanced regulators, all right? But yeah, basically what happens in the balanced first stage is that the tank pressure has no bearing on opening any valves. Okay? They do breathe much easier, especially at depth, right? and there's no change in effort at depth or tank pressure. So with an <clears throat> a unbalanced first stage, you may actually see that there is, or feel that there is a difference when you're breathing in and out at depth or when your tank pressure gets low, because the tank pressure actually assists the opening of valves in an unbalanced first stage. The tank pressure assists opening or closing the valve, so obviously at this, as a tank pressure decreases, it makes it harder. The tank pressure and depth can have an effect on the ease of breathing. 
All right. We have an environmental seal. It prevents the first stage freeze up by preventing water to enter it. It is oil or silicon filled. So you may have a regulator, your own regulator, have a look at it, all right? Um, where you find that there is a, a rubber seal on it, which allows the pressure to activate or work on the first stage, but you don't actually have water entering um, it, all right? So in our regulator here, all right, we actually, if you have a look at your first stage, and you'll find that there's holes there. That's where the water will enter the first stage and have an effect on the mechanisms that happens inside. So an environmental seal makes sure that there is basically like a diaphragm in front of it, filled with oil or silicon, all right, that prevents water from entering, all right, especially in cold water, will then prevent it from freezing up. So important to remember that. If we have a look at our second stages, it reduces the intermediate pressure to the ambient pressure. And here's a diagram of how a second stage looks like. All right. um, you have pilot valves that assist in opening valves to make inhalation easier. All right. um, one, of the, one of the functions on there. And there are what was called a downstream design. Okay, the pressure open valves causing regulator to free flow in case of malfunction, also known as fail safe. So we would remember from having been in courses where students put their mouthpieces, for example, in the water with the mouthpiece facing up and all of a sudden starts free flowing. All right, that is again um, the free flowing effect that the pressure assists in opening the valves never in shutting the valve. So if something was to malfunction in here, all right, the valves will open and continuously free flow. It's one of the reasons why in the open water course what we have to do is learn how to breathe from a free flowing regulator. All right? If we would all have done that, air gets very cold, teeth get a bit cold, lots of air bubbling around. All right? So that is the reason for certainly teaching that skill. <coughs> all right. The ultimate air source, um, brightly yellow marked, also is referred to as an octopus. All right. um, same um, as the second stage, just with a longer hose and clearly marked bright and yellow. And um, that's just for ease of recognition. All right, we want to position that triangle somewhere from chin to the bottom of the rib cage. That's where it should be positioned. All right. We have all sorts of different ways of attaching it. All right, one of the things on that buddy check that we do before every dive is to make sure that you are familiar with how that alternate air source is positioned on your partner. All right? um, some may have a clip where it's in here. Um, the school BCDs that <coughs> we use currently have a little sleeve here where we actually tuck that alternate air source in just like that. So it's easily pulled out and presented to the partner, right? Or you may have other ways of securing that alternate air source so that it doesn't float around and it's easily obviously found. All right, any questions on that so far? No? All right, next piece of equipment is our submersible pressure gauge. All right. Um, we have two systems. We have a metric system and an imperial system. Certainly divers from the States all right, will have been taught in the Imperial system and um, it's just good to know what the equivalent is. 3000 PSI is roughly the same as our 200 bar. Okay? So um, it's just a different measurement of the pressure that's in our tank. Okay? Um, again, we have a caution zone, 50 bar or 600 PSI and just marked in red. So, Submersible pressure gauge is there to tell us how much air we've got left in our tank. Okay, um, here we have a Bourdon tube. Okay, um, and this is one of the ways um, the submersible pressure gauges work. All right, the tube bends straight and the movement pushes the needle. So, as the pressure enters in here, all right, the higher the pressure, the more this curvature is bent out. With a little lever 
on here than moving the actual gauge. All right? So that's an inside how our air gauge works and shows us how much air we still have. All right. Then our depth gauges, we have capillary depth gauges. Capillary depth gauges are very, very good for altitude diving. All right? And it's based on an air-filled tube. So on this one here, what I want you to notice is that, have a look at the distance from zero to three meters, three to six, six to nine, and you see how the distance is? I mean, this is 10 meters here, how small that distance is, versus the first 10 meters here. So based on that, and what we've previously learned in our physics discussion, have you got an idea of how this might work? In what way? In what way? Well, as you get lower, the pressure increases, so therefore you have a lesser um, gradient of movement. Okay. To a so, in previous discussions, we had a look at a depth of 0 meters, 10 meters, 20 meters, and 30 meters. Alright? We have pressure of one, two, three, four bar, all right? And then we have volume. And here it's one liter, here it's half a liter, here it's a third, and here it's a quarter, all right? The biggest volume change is in the first 10 meters here, all right? 0.5. And then we go from 0 0.5 to 0 0.33. So that is only Small a smaller increment. All right. So um, 0 0.27, right? No, 1.7. All right. So much smaller increment. All right. So looking back to this gauge, that is how this gauge works. Okay, it is actually air filled, and as we're descending, the volume, the water goes into this tube and pushes the needle up. So that's why these are much, much bigger distances than over here, because the volume change is smaller. So a capillary gauge is based on air filled tube that as we're descending, the water goes in, all right? So they're very, very accurate in the first 10 meters, and then as deeper we go, just the spacing becomes smaller and smaller. All right, the reason they are really good for altitude diving is simply because of the fact that they adjust to the altitude, okay? So, so they won't become saturated. Kind of well, they're, they're open filled, right. all right? So they're starting off at the correct pressure at that altitude. And as we're descending, that water goes in. So they're actually telling us the correct depth, all right? Whereas other gauges are calibrated to be zero at sea level. But if we're at altitude, they're actually below zero. Below zero, so it take longer. And as we're going diving for the first, say, one or two meters, then they make their way to zero. So, so the depth is wrong. So they take longer to get to three than what we would at sea level. Sorry? So if you're diving at altitude with those, they take longer to get to three. No, they're so accurate. So they so will they actually so tell you that you're at three meters. Oh, okay. Whereas your normal pressure gauges, or depth gauges, sorry, they're actually starting you off below zero yeah. and with the pressure making their way up. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, cool. Alrighty, let's have a look at scuba tanks. Um, but first of all, what does scuba stand for? Self contained underwater breathing apparatus. Alright, very embarrassing as dive instructor if we don't know what scuba stands for. Alright. Um, Righty up. Bunch of different markings on those scuba tanks. Look, for the recreational diver, 
what all these numbers mean on the scuba tanks is really not that important. What certainly is important is the test stamp and different test stamps um, look slightly different from country to country and different rules as to when tests should be done. So in Australia, hydrostatic tests every 12 months, including a visual test. In some other countries, one every five years. All right, so it just depends from country to country. But here, every 12 months. All right. So um, on the tank valves themselves, or on the tanks, we have different um, markings. We have Department of Transport, right, the metal type, working pressure, the serial number, manufacturer, overfill allowed, and some of them they'll have a plus sign that allows you to overfill them by 10%, the hydrostatic test date, and the hydrostatic test marker. So that looks slightly different to what we have here. All right. What we have here, for example, is an O2, the test stamp, and then say 18 below it, that tells us that the tank was tested second month by this test station in 2018. All right. Um, so we, those are the general markings. All right. We have a, another one here in Australia. All right. So AS1777, that's Australian standard. Okay. The tear weight, 14.26 kilo. Working pressure 24.0 megapascals at 15 degrees Celsius. All right, so 240 bar at 15 degrees Celsius. Remember from our previous section on physics, temperature has an effect. Oh, sorry, pressure and temperature. All right, if a tank heats up, the more pressure that it becomes. All right, as the tank cools down. All right, so this is just to point out that the working pressure is 240 at 15 degrees Celsius. If the temperature was hotter than that, that would obviously be slightly different. All right. Um, test pressure, 360 or 36.0 megapascals. Water capacity is 10.4 kilos or 10.4 liters. So that's how deep the tank is. And then you have a serial number as well. Right. So that just goes to show that there's different markings on different tanks from country to country, but we should be familiar with them. All right. A hydrostatic inspection, what we actually do is we place the tank in a water bath. We take the valve off, we fill the tank with water. All right. Water doesn't compress, so we're filling the tank up under pressure and that metal of the tank is actually expanding. As that expands, the water level rises. As we drop the pressure, the metal contracts, the water level drops again. All right? That variance, it should come back to its original or roughly within, within a given tolerance, that water level should come back. If it doesn't, that means that that tank hasn't contracted back and the metal may be fatigued. That's one way of the tank failing its hydrostatic test. All right. What is the variance? I'm not 100% sure what the variance is, no. But um, yeah, every test station would have that, obviously, you know, and have a look at that. All right. So um, in Australia, as I said, we do this every 12 months. All right. And if it fails, basically what happens, um, some places will just drill holes in it so that you cannot use it again. All right. Other places, maybe even cut the tank in half, all right, um, and give it back to you in two pieces. A visual inspection, again, in Australia is annually, um, different in other countries, all right, just depending on what rules they have. And certainly, we want to do a visual inspection if the history is unknown, right? It's something we just bought the tank, okay. Um, or if it's emptied, if it's completely empty, all right. So what happens, for example, every time we fill a tank, you would have seen some people, what they do before they fill a tank, they just crack the tank valve open slightly. What that does, it pushes any water out of that tank valve. Now what you don't need to, you don't need to open it all the way, you just need to slowly open it a little bit. All right? Pushes all the water out because when you're filling it in, if you don't do that, 
Whatever water was in there is going to get pushed into the tank. All right? Water will build up, can cause corrosion. All right? So visual inspection, if the history is unknown or certainly if it's emptied, okay, or if the valve is removed. All right, when we remove the valve, basically we put a light in there, have a look around, okay, and see if there's anything wrong with the tank inside. Alright, um, different materials, um, aluminum, less subject to structural weaknessing due to corrosion. Uh, it, has, it is a thicker material. It is lighter and buoyancy increases as it empties. So you would have known yourself in your dives, we're swimming around, we're guiding certified divers, everybody is beautifully um, uh, neutrally buoyant, swimming around, right? We come towards the end of the dive, we have 70, 80 bar left, all right? And all of a sudden, all of our divers are struggling with their buoyancy because that tank, getting empty now, has positive buoyancy. Right, so that's something to, to keep in mind. In comparison to steel, so steel tanks are made of a thinner material, all right, um, and remain negatively buoyant all the time. All right, so they will not, um, even, even empty tanks, even empty steel tank will sink down to the bottom, whereas an empty aluminium tank will float. Okay. All right, on our scuba tank, we have scuba tank we have valves, um, and the first one comes from the Fatherland, a DIN valve, all right? Stands for Deutsche Industrie Norm, which means German industry normal thing, yeah. All right, so the difference with this one is that it screws into the tank valve, all right? So the first stage screws into the tank valve, and on this one here, you'll see that there, there's threads in there. The first stage there, we'll screw that into the, into the tank valve. You'll find on this valve here, there is a, um, a, an Allen key that you can put in there. You can actually pull this bit out where the O-ring sits, and you'll end up with the exact same valve here. All right. um, DIN um, tank valves are becoming more and more popular. All right but still by far um, the most ones that I use are the yoke ones where the first stage just fits over and we screw them in, just like this regulator here, sits, sits over it, so we have a dust cap, all right, push that over the tank valve, finger tight, pull it shut, all right. So there's two different tank valves as such there, we have a yoke, and a DIN. Right? It's a stronger connection and certainly liked by tech divers. Right? Um, what about you? You got yokes or DIN? DIN. DIN? DIN? Yeah. Yeah, uh, over in DIN. Oh, cool. Alright, yoke is the most popular and just fits over the valve. Alright, and as we've shown here, um, some you can actually just unscrew them and make the normal valve a DIN valve. All right. Um, all right, we have a valve debris tube, which is this one here, okay? It's just a tube that is attached to the, to the, to the tank valve, which sits in the tank, all right? It prevents moisture or debris entering the valve with swimming head down. You can imagine if I'm swimming along and I'm swimming this, heading down, head first, for whatever reason, if there was any moisture in that tank, right, it would basically flow into the valve and allowing it to come into um, the regulator. Right? With this valve debris tube, that's what it's there to prevent it from happening. Make sense? All right. Scuba tanks, more. We have a different types. We have a K valve and a J valve, all right? A K valve is what is used today. Um, a J valve was what we had in the very early days before we had actual air gauges, all right? So on this lever here was a rod, all right? And what I could do when I was realizing, oh, it's getting hard to breathe, the tank must be close to empty, 
I could pull that rod down, opens that up, which releases more air, um, which when obviously allows me to um, finish my dive and ascent, not keep on swimming around, but coming up to the ascent. I believe, so I've heard, the reason why one's called the K-valve and one's called the J-valve is simply when a lot of scuba diving was manufactured many, many years ago, somebody had a catalog and he listed all the equipment in, in, and gave them an alphabetical code, all right? And that one just happened to be where J was, that one happened to be the K was. So there's no real theory as to why one or the other. So the J valve got its name from being the number J in one of the first steward equipment manufacturer catalogs. The current valve at the time was item K and it's now called the K valve. The J valve is a spring loaded mechanism and was designed as a means to warn the diver has run low on air. At the beginning of the dive the reserve valve is closed but it is on a spring set to about 35 bar. As long as there's more than 35 bar in the tank, the spring is pushed back and air flows. When the tank pressure drops below the spring threshold pressure, the spring has more power than the air pressure and it closes. All right, to release the pressure, the diver pulls on the lever, releasing at the last 35 bar by opening the reserve valve to finish the dive before the reserve was consumed. It's a warning system, all right? Divers would inadvertently trigger the mechanism and not realize that a reserve had been accessed. So you're swimming around, you accidentally knock on something, right? you pull that lever down, it's down, you don't know that, you can see it, right? and they could find themselves out of air at depth with no warning whatsoever. When filling a cylinder equipped with a J valve, the reserve lever must be in the down position. So it must be down when filling it, then before you go diving, top it up to set your ear. Alrighty, uh, burst discs. All right. So on our scuba tank, in the valve right here, we have a burst disc in there. All right. What the burst disc does, it bursts if the pressure gets too high. Okay. It's a copper disc that will burst at 140% of tank working pressure. All right. So this picture here is of a vehicle. You left your car, your, your, your tank in your vehicle. Yep, you know how hot it gets in a car. The pressure increases, gets bigger and bigger and bigger. All right, and that bird tank probably didn't have a burst disc. All right, and exploded. All right, um, you're dealing with a pressure vessel, the tank that is got 200 bar of pressure in it. All right, it's an awful lot of pressure. All right. Now, with these um, burst discs, um, a few years ago, they only had one hole, all right? So the burst disc broke, all right? And all the air would escape out of one hole and that tank would go spinning around, all right? Until they realized that if I put another hole on the other side as well, all right? The air will come out simultaneously, all right? And will prevent that from happening. Very good, all right. That is a quick review on, on um, equipment. All right. Obviously, um, in our instructor level course, BCDs, we should be familiar with them. All right. We have normal BCDs like these. Some of you may have BCDs with integrated weight pockets, all right. where, where you can adjust, um, put weights inside the BCD. They have quick releases themselves. All right. um, other than that, mask, regular snorkel, all those sort of things. Alright. Any questions on equipment?